to do, I would like to introduce Josh S. from Airfoil Capital, who's going to be talking about network attacks and payment system obfuscation. Thank you, hello. My name is Josh. Um, like I, like uh, Sarang just said, I'll be speaking about network attacks and obfuscation of private payment systems. A little background on me, I was involved in privacy security consulting for clients that had publicly facing data that they, I would go and I would help them erase this data on the internet. And then also besides that, I was consulting for clients that were ranging from high net worth individuals all the way up to exchanges building self-custodial self wallets. So uh, right now I'm currently the CTO at Airfoil Capital, but enough about me, let's get started. Uh, let's see. Okay. First, I want to mention what Monero does. I want to focus on what it currently offers, and then I want to address what users can do today in terms of network obfuscation. And then I also want to look at what other projects are doing, both the good and the bad, and other crypto projects. And then finally, I want to look at what Monero in the near term, what they have on the roadmap, what is planned in, uh, for Monero, and then also the long term. What are other possible protocol impl uh, implementations that we could push into? So, okay, so we all know the protocol layer. Uh, Monero has ring CT, ring signatures, stealth addresses. But it doesn't really address anonymity on the network level. So this is my focus, is really how we can further address this for the end user. Threat model, the threat model, what I'm looking for in this talk, what I'm focusing on is who are we trying to keep this information from or who are we trying to anonymize this data from? And we are, I'm looking at this as a, a global passive adversary. So a global passive adversary, meaning they observe all traffic on the network. They don't interact with it, but they are able to collect all network information. Issues that exist today, network de-anonymization. So there are tools that exist that anybody can use to capture packets. There's free, and open, uh, free open source tools that anybody can use. And the protocol analyzers, they are able to analyze exactly what is happening with these packets. By doing this observation, you can perform certain types of attacks. One, one uh, specific example is a correlation attack. If you collect enough information, somebody submitting some kind of information on the network, you can correlate with enough packets, you can correlate that this information is coming from this user. And by de-anonymizing or correlating that it's coming from, let's say, this IP or this device, you could then perform censorship attacks Censorship attack, of course, saying, listen, we're not going to, this network is going to accept any kind of information from this node or these nodes or this device. So correlation and censorship attacks tend to go hand in hand. Now, how can a transaction be de-anonymized? Right now, here's just a screenshot of Wireshark. Once again, it's a free open source tool that is available for anybody to use. Users right now, you guys in the seats, me up here, you can use this. Anybody can grab it. So the screenshot shows exactly packets being captured and you can further click in and further get information on what these packets are doing or where they're going. So this is a perfect example of a tool that anybody can grab, use. And now with an attacker, like a global passive adversary, obviously they are going to be much more uh, well-funded than a normal user or somebody in their basement hacking away. So just imagine if these tools are available for free, what do you think a global passive adversary would use to further analyze traffic? So where can we go, where, what, what can we do today? What can we do as of now? What can be done as users in your seats right now, users back home, what can they do? So first I wanna to touch on VPNs. I'm sure most of us have heard this solution. VPNs, high level VPNs are virtual private networks. They encrypt traffic from end to end from your device to your destination. One second. Okay, so first of all, if we're looking for anonymity, uh, VPNs with anonymity, we have to also understand what our threat model is. Once again, threat model that we're looking at or that I was looking at for this what is the global passive adversary. So you need to realize if you are trying to remain anonymous, how exactly are you going to obtain this VPN subscription? VPNs work through specific subscriptions. You can pay for it. You can use free ones, but I would advise you not to use that because once again, if you are not, there's, they end up selling your data if you are pay, getting it for free. So you need to obviously realize to go after trusted uh, VPN providers. So if you're also looking for pure anonymity, you need to realize how you obtain the subscription must also be done anonymously. 
So you can do, you can, certain VPN providers allow accepting uh, payment by cash via the mail. So you can create a, a, the way it works is you create a profile through the site. They give you a subscription number. What you do is in an envelope, you put their address, you send whatever your little numeric number that they give you is, nothing else is attached to you, send it through the mail. That's you, how you can obtain your subscription. You can also buy it with Monero or use gift cards. Gift cards, of course, if you're trying to do that anonymously, obviously you'd be paying cash and you want to make sure that how, if you're really worried about your, anonymous, your level of anonymity, you want to make sure that uh, the facial recognition at the specific place that you're buying these VPN, um, that these gift cards also is uh, dissipated. So that's another level. So really briefly, I want to make a disclaimer. I'm not affiliated with uh, that one privacy site or that one privacy guy, but I think the tool that he has available uh, that he's made available online is a extremely good tool for anybody to use. I'm going to address that in the next slide. So a lot of times if you're looking for what is a good VPN provider, you'll have these websites. If you go to search, you know, top, v top 10 VPNs, you'll have all these different sites say, you know, this is the best VPN, this is the be best VPN. But a lot of time these websites, they're affiliates, so they're paid to pump these different VPNs. So they're shilling the these products. So what that one privacy guy aims to do is he is aiming to be as neutral as possible, and he makes a gigantic uh, chart. With this chart, uh, he, he compares about 100 different VPNs, and these 100 different VPNs, he compares them in about 30 different categories. I've only got, I don't know, 10 in this, in this category. So you need to realize choosing a, if you're choosing, if you're trying to get, become as anonymous as possible, Jurisdiction, you've got to realize what jurisdiction is located in, what country it's located in, because, of course, the legal issues come into play. Are they in a 14 eyes country? Are they in a country that's an enemy of the Internet? Do they log IPs? Do they log DNS requests? How exactly do they accept uh, payment? So there's many other tools that, that you can look into, but this is just uh, a little screenshot, like I said, of what exactly it looks like. So the, downsi the, the downsides of using VPNs. Of course, in the end, you're trusting a centralized system. We all know the issues with trusting a centralized system. Also, law enforcement agencies, like I mentioned before, with jurisdiction and subpoenas, if they are given a subpoena, they have to, of course, observe whatever the law enforcement agency is saying uh, in their country of origin. Of course, with a large enough attacker, correlation attacks can also be carried out. And like I said, we are imagining a global passive adversary, so they are large enough. And with long enough time, you can still de-anonymize this traffic. Another tool that we can use today besides VPNs, Tor. So I'm sure most of us here understand, know what Tor is, but I'll just give a high level rundown of what Tor uh, aims to accomplish. Tor is the onion router. It uses onion routing to route your, your traffic. So a good example is, or just uh, an example of exactly how Tor works is, you're a user and you connect to three different nodes and the way that these nodes, the node can only see one jump behind it and one jump in front of it. So it's a multi-hop system and you go through three different nodes. So your device connects to node one. Node one knows where the traffic originated from and knows that it's going to node two, but it doesn't know your destination. Now node two then gets that traffic. Node two knows where your traffic, uh, knows, that it, knows that it came from node one, but it doesn't know where it originated from and it knows that it's going to node three, but it doesn't know the destination. Now node three gets the traffic. Node three only knows that it came from node two and the destination, but it doesn't know the origination at all. So high level, I hope that wasn't confusing, but high level, that's, that's what Tor aims to achieve. That's not including uh, hidden services. So I wanted to mention three operating systems that, lever that leverage Tor. First one is Tails. Tails is an amnesic operating system. It's on a live, it's a live bootable disk, so it's a USB that you can plug into your device. And all traffic is routed through Tor. And when you're done with it, it's non-persistent. So once you unplug Tails, the data is wiped. And when you go to use it again, you plug it back in. There's no information there. It's like a completely new session. Like I said, all data runs through Tor. Hunix is another operating system that leverages Tor. Same exact thing. All traffic is routed through there. And then Cubes is another operating system that virtualizes different cells for you to perform different operations in. You can then use a Hunix gateway to route all your traffic through Tor again. 
And you can also leverage AppVM if you're worried about VPNs. You can also use VPNs. You can use it for VPN chaining, putting a VPN around a VPN, uh, nested VPNs, really. Downsides of Tor. Its documentation says semi-trusted directory authorities, but they're trusted directory authorities. They're not, there's not many of them. And so once again, we know the issues with trusted directory authorities with there being any kind of trust. Law enforcement agencies controlling exit nodes. We've seen the problem. We've seen academic papers coming out and the amount of, we don't know the exact number of law enforcement agencies that control exit nodes, but we know that it's being monitored. Correlation attacks performed against nodes. We're assuming a global passive adversary, so we're expecting all nodes to be compromised. And of course, civil attacks can also be carried out as well. Okay, so I also wanted to talk about other crypto projects of importance. Of course, it's MoneroCon, of course, but there are some very interesting projects that are you know, trying to work on similar, similar aspects. Oopsie. Okay, first I wanted to touch on Grin. Grin uh, implements Dandelion. So high level, what Dandelion aims to achieve is it, during the stem phase, it quietly propagates the network. It goes to a few set, uh, cer certain set of nodes. Then when it reaches, once it reaches enough nodes, it reaches the fluff phase, where it then bursts out the transaction across the network. Now, I just, was I just made sure I had clarification on this. With a global passive adversary, this can still be de-anonymized because, of course, the network is being completely surveilled. So Grin is also working on implementing I2P over transactions, which I will speak about I2P in a few minutes. Just wanted to say that they're looking at that. Zcash over Tor. Today, you can use Zcash over Tor. You can also use Zcash uh, over Tor you can submit transactions to hidden services, using hidden services. So that's something of note, as well as they're looking at mixed networks, which I will also speak about in just a few moments. I also want to talk about Ethereum smart uh, privacy tokens, what Enigma and ASIC protocol are looking to use and leverage. So Enigma aims to leverage private smart contracts. So with these private smart contracts, the whole goal is to make sure anything inside the smart contracts, if you're not using Enigma right now, you're using an openly available, openly visible smart contract that anybody can see that is viewing the network. With private smart contracts, they aim to close that up. You, you can see, though, this is the issue with Enigma in the sense that you can still get network metadata that this address is using a private smart contract. You can't tell what's going on inside it, but that you can tell that you can glean from that information that they are using this private smart contract. Aztec Protocol suffers from a similar fate. Uh, they are looking to do confidential transactions over Ethereum. So once again, it leverages that privacy on the network, but you can still tell that they are performing these transactions. You can't, at least from current uh, analysis, you can't tell what they are exactly doing, but you can tell they are sending private transactions on the chain. What does the future hold? Where exactly are we going? What are possible, like, uh, like I said, in the near term and the long term solutions that could possibly be implemented? Doesn't, this isn't law, but these are just solutions that are out there. Our very own VT nerd will be speaking next after me. He'll be speaking about tor broadcasting transaction over Tor, so I will let Lee touch on that. But I wanted to touch on I2P0 and Tiny I2P as well as mixed nets. First, with I2P0 and Tiny I2P. I2P is the Invisible Internet Project, and so they take the I2P takes what Tor does and takes it a little further. So Tiny I2P and I2P Sierra, they're both I2P routers. Tiny I2P is a lightweight C++ implementation of I2P, while I2P Zero is a Java implementation, but you can use it cross-platform. Now, the difference between I2P and Tor is Tor only encrypts TCP traffic, while I2P encrypts both UDP and TCP traffic. Now, in the upcoming uh, Monero releases, I believe Tor is already being pushed into it, but I2P, I think, in the upcoming releases will have I2P integration, so transmitting transactions over I2P. Mixnets. Mixnets first came into, I guess the idea for Mixnets first came into being David Chalm's 1982 academic paper, I believe. Uh, I believe it was 1982. So there's a few different systems for mixnets. I will be talking about the Lupix system. So mixnets then take what I2P does and what Tor aims to accomplish and pushes it a little further. So 
it, it offers protection against end-to-end -end correlation attacks. So it aims to leverage this idea of sending random packets through nodes. Sometimes they are the real packets, sometimes they are, it's dummy data. So by different nodes randomly sending out information, like I said, it could be the real data, it could be the false data, or it could be false data, it could be just dummy data, like I said. From all these different nodes, it creates that end-to-end -end correlation attack because it prevents, it gives protection against those end-to-end -end correlation attacks because your node, maybe your device, is also sending and receiving real and false data at the same time. So if somebody is watching, a global adversary is watching the network, they can still not, there's still a plausible deniability. They can only tell that this person is using or these individuals are using mixed nets. This also allows for sender and receiver unobservability. Once again, if your device is sending and receiving dummy data as well as real data, both Alice and Bob, if they are sending and receiving that information, you have that unobservability because once again, there's that plausible deniability in the sense that you cannot tell if they are actually even submitting any transactions over the network or if it's just spam. So also, ITP leverages, I, I did not say in the previous slide, the, the nodes are chosen randomly. As opposed to a centralized directory authority, each node chooses a random path. So once again, that, those kind of correlations are mitigated, those kind of correlation attacks. Now, this is the one thing even I2P does not implement, are timing, timing held variations. So a timing attack can't really be performed on, at, at least for this level. So they hold these packets. Let's say you're sending transactions. There are these different timing. Uh, they, they keep them in, let's say, a certain escrow before they send it. But like I said, that, that varies, the exact timing. It's not exactly, I don't have it defined here. But th those timing, can, that different timing scale can help mitigate, let's say, when you're sending transactions. Though, I guess another question would sort of be, if you're sending a transaction, how does that, that timing delay, how can that affect block times? How can that send actual transactions? But uh, I, I didn't go into that. I just wanted to address the timing and packet delivery. So what exactly is the benefit of hiding your IP address and network metadata? Obviously, it offers censorship resistance. If no one can tell that you are actually using this network or you are going to be involved in using these, these types of networks, these types of obfuscation networks, they can't, let's say a global passive adversary can't go and decide that they want to go and censor your nodes, censor the nodes that are, that are helping to process your transactions. Now, does this give true anonymity? I mean, I, I, th I think to say that it gives true anonymity, you know, that, that's, that's very naive, but how much does it really give us? Now, before I finish this, this presentation, I wanna leave you with two questions. First one, should these network layer solutions be made mandatory? Similar to ring signatures, our ring signatures, we have an anonymity set of 11, should this should your, should your transaction always be put over the network over these kinds of other networks? When the IP, the other question is, when the IP network problem is solved, what is the next issue that the community will need to address to reach per perfect anonymity? If this, let's say this solves the network issue, what, what, is the, what are the other issues that we will face or the community will face to further anonymize transactions? In conclusion, network is one of the largest, last obstacles to address. It is very difficult to address anonymity systems. There's a reason Tor has been around for almost two decades, and even in their documentation, they do not address a global passive adversary. So anonymity systems are still very new, and they are on the forefront of trying to understand the issues. There are projects that, is, that exist today that attempt to address this, like I said, the good and the bad, but there's also many projects to look towards and possibly implement. The goal for my talk was more or less to, besides just looking at Tor, besides just looking at I2P, besides just looking at MixSense, to realize that there are other solutions out there that can be leveraged. And from what I've seen, the Monero community is very, very adaptive and they, will, they can look and sort of make the pieces fit. So I think that just even just getting the ball rolling and speaking from an educational standpoint of what other solutions are out there, I think it's just a good conversation. So you can, you can email me if there's any other questions that you don't get here at josh at airfoilcapital.com and I will take other questions right now if you have any. Thank you. References, references, references. If not. Yep. 
Yeah. Uh, how do you how do you think we can communicate the subtleties between say Tor, I2P, Mixnets uh, to someone who doesn't really understand um, what kind of you know IP addresses are? Yeah. If, for example, in the GUI or a mobile wallet, how do we actually communicate that? I think the easiest way is to you know speak in speak in their language uh, first to make it as simple as possible first because if if they don't understand the network level you know even down to IP addresses I feel like you have to give examples like uh, the talk before me the Open Money Initiative those examples that you could see the real life examples that he had from the people that were speaking how they had to do these transactions or how they could possibly do it I think making it really apparent to them how exactly they could address this and then further extrapolating you know maybe getting a little deeper, deeper, and just explaining how this can affect you. I think just more or less starting at a broad level and then bringing it down. I think that's, I mean, if, if no one understands IP address, then Tor, even explaining what Tor is, is going to be difficult. So I think just starting at a broad level and just saying there, there's issues here and give examples, I think that's, that's super helpful. There's a question right there. Hi, um, I know there's been some work around um, incentivized Tor-like nodes using cryptocurrencies. Mm. Do you have any thoughts on those and their application? I, I haven't heard about incentivized nodes for Tor, but I've heard of um, a decentralized uh, VPNs that were also looking to leverage something similar to that. Uh, I, think, I think it's a you know, smart way to get people involved. Now, the only thing is... I think there's obviously game theory, game theoretic issues that can come up that, you know, if you're incentivizing the right amount of people or now if people say, listen, I want to take this VPN offline or this node offline so I can then obtain funds or I can get more of my traffic. Then you've got people that are attacking, you know, there's people that are attacking these VPN nodes because they want to have their VPN node obtain the most throughput. I think that, that can be an issue there or obtain the most traffic. I think... So I don't, I don't really know myself. I, I don't want to give a broad answer, but I think putting that out there and saying, listen, let's see, let's see what happens. And if it, doesn't, if it fails, I mean, we'll, you end up learning from it and you go, you know what, this didn't work, but maybe something that uses some kind of consensus mechanism where people aren't incentivized to go destroy other nodes, I think that, that would be helpful as well. All right. Uh, thank you, guys. Thank you so much.